explanation of this desire, death <coughs> for one's own language, and a simultaneous categorical embrace of the dominant other, has surely to go beyond the uses or not of the languages in question, or the fact of having to engage with the language of power, meaning in a language of power, say if you are an immigrant here, English is the language of power. I have to use it, right? If you don't use it, I don't get a job at, uh, in, at the University of Massachusetts, right? I can't come for a job here as a professor of, at something. And I say, do you know English? I say, oh, no. What language do you have? I have a koyo and it's <laughs> Zulu. Huh? Uh, they will say, oh, oh, uh, right? You know, so really, you have to engage the language of power. But that's a very different thing from becoming its captive, okay? That's a different thing. Uh, so so this, I'm sorry to say, this question really goes beyond what is necessitated by having to cope with the reality of the language of power or even the accent of power. It's something else. And I think we can find an answer that lies in how that sense of dominance was brought about. Laura O'Connor, and my colleague at the University of California, Irvine, has talked about the cultural violence at the heart of linguistic imperialism. The nearest parallel is the case of physically abused children who end up identifying with their abusers, or captives who end up carrying out the mission of their captors with sincerity and even resolve. If you look at a common thread in the export of English in Scotland, Wales, Ireland, and Africa particularly, was a constant association of extreme humiliation and negativity with native languages, and the corresponding value and prestige accorded English in colonial education factories. Corporal punishment, physical violence, was often meted to children called speaking mother tongues in school compounds. And additionally, made to perform acts of shame, like carrying objects that proclaimed their stupidity. Or even, in some cases, made to swallow filth, in some cases, associating their language with filth. And when I was in Wales some years ago, I was the same thing in the case of Wales. Huh? You know, Welsh children were made to carry a placard saying, where else not? If they sat in front of the class with, where else not? And carry it, where else not? The whole day, right? To make, it becomes a shame. It's, it becomes a language of humiliation, hmm? right? So one set of languages was associated with defeat, shame, incoherence, savagery even and the other with modernity, science, rationality, humanity, conquest, power. No wonder that people would want to bask in the sunshine of the language of glory and victory and escape from those of shame and defeat. And to explain, we have to go, I think, to psychology. And again, I'm not a psychologist, but you may find the case of uh, behavior psychology in Skinner's work interesting. Because that's probably the reminiscent of Skinner's instrumental or operant conditioning. This is a well-known technique. Reinforcement of the desired behavior, in this case, English or French, and the punishment for the undesired behavior in the colonized language. 
Very important. You do something, you are rewarded when it's English. When the other, you are punished. Right? Pain with one, pleasure <laughs> with the other. Right? But in the end, the operant generates a Pavlonian state. You all know about the experiment of Pavlov, right? Right? This is something I've, you know, I've heard about this, how you train a dog, you ring a bell, or something. You first of all, when you ring a bell, there's food. Later, you don't need to even have food there. You ring a bell, and the sound, the sound makes the dog salivate, correct? The sound alone. So you don't have to see food, the sound and salivating with desire. So in the end, the operant generates a Pavlovian state. The sound of the word English immediately conjuring intelligence, modernity, complexity, universality, making the brain salivate with desire. And the sound of the undesired ones with the opposite. Simplicity, naivety, emotions. <laughs> like Africans, when we talk about it, we say, oh, when I want to swear, I swear in my African language. <laughs> but when I want to be serious, rational, French. <laughs> <laughs> naivety, emotions, backwardness, and develop, making the brain dry up at the sound of, or desalivate, at the process of use. All these processes that I talked about can impact language acquisition in such a way as to normalize the abnormal. This is certainly the case in post-colonial Africa and the formerly colonized world as a whole. Abnormality has been turned into normality. So our starting point is just the abnormality underlies the very, because what we need is our rational behavior when it comes to language. Mm. There can also be a kind of nationalistic and even nostalgic reaction to the loss of the native. Well, even if it's okay, use it as a kind of archive, an, an antiquity from which to draw enough to carve one's place in the linguistic empire, kind of. The native becomes an archeological site from which to mine antiques, to decorate, or give clues to the present. And yet, it's interesting that ironically here, Edmund Spencer, Matt, even Matthew Arnold, William Yeats, James Street are united in this view, that you can actually do that, right? <laughs> they can mine from Irish and traditions, okay, to decorate the house of power, or to decorate the room they have acquired within the house of power, if you like. Linguistic power, that is. All these, they saw the chaotic as a whole as such an archaeological site for the study of antiquity. It's also interesting. You can go back and see the origins of language. Hmm, okay. Dead languages are not without their uses. They help decorate and, and enrich the texture of the linguistic house of power. This may even involve smuggling of words into the language of the empire. Our like joys, for instance, and most of us, am I included, okay? I'm not speaking for a holier than now attitude. But this practice merely enriches and enlarges the capacity or the reach of metaphysical empires. It's all right to do if you want to, but don't think that you're doing something for either Irish or, or Kikuyu or Igbo. You are not. It's not possible that you are doing anything towards, adding anything towards your, 
you are enriching the other and its capacity, okay? And it's amazing to me how the entire academic and intellectual world, with me included, keep on asserting that African writing in European languages is indeed African literature. They even give prizes today for African kids to write as winning or whatever on a condition that they don't write it in an African language. Prizes both in Africa and outside, a lot of money are given, but on condition they don't write in an African language. Right? But this prize is supposed to encourage African literature, but not in an African language. 